Amen, amen. Well, we're, we're uh, going through the book of Romans, and, uh, uh, you know, we saw in Romans 1 uh, about uh, the power of the resurrection, and we saw also the, the heathen and, and the fact that God has written in the, even in the heathen's heart and conscience what the law is, so they're without excuse for sinning. There are the, we also saw that many times people say, well, uh, the, the gospel hasn't reached every continent, but it has. Uh, the Bible says it has, and it hasn't reached every peoples on every continent, but it has reached every continent and every country. And there are a lot of people don't don't realize that some of the countries we call the most heathen today had the gospel preached at them, but they rejected it, and that's why they're heathens today. And uh, they talked in the first chapter about how once they head down that road, uh, 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 they they become more depraved and more depraved and. And there was uh, men burning in lust for one another and women changing the natural use of their body. And every now and then somebody will say, well, I just don't believe a person ought to uh, mention homosexuality from the pulpit. But uh, uh, I'll mention homosexuality from the pulpit, uh, drunkenness, addiction, anything uh, that I know that the Bible speaks against. Amen? And, uh, uh, but we're not haters, are we? Don't ever become haters. Uh, 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 the truth about it is I was challenged whether or not I should ever let a homosexual in the front door. I said, you think homosexuals are wearing little neon lights saying I am a homosexual? I want everybody to come through the front door, and we're going to love them on all of them the same way. Amen? Amen. Are you in agreement with that? Yes. And so there are, there are heathens in the world. There are heathens that act good, and they look like good people. The, the Bible says in the second chapter that there are, there are the Jews and the religious man who thinks he's going to make it because he's a religious man. But by the way, we get to the third chapter, we realize that it didn't make a difference if you're religious unbeliever or a religious believer. The truth about it is, is that uh, 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 the religious believers who are going to go to the Lord, if you're, if you're as religious as you can be, but you're an unbeliever, you're not going to go to heaven, right? So what the Bible said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Hoover's, look back there, see right over there. Look who wandered in late. That's the first time I've ever known Rachel to be late. The first time today. But, uh, <laughs> so the Bible puts us all, without Christ, we're all under sin. Nobody can say this person's good and this one's bad. The Bible said there's none good, no, not one. Amen? And so we all need Christ. But what sometimes Christians want to do is they'll say, that person needs Christ more than the other. No, I don't care who you are. Your works are your filthy rags unto the Lord. The only way you'll make it to Christ is to uh, make it to heaven is to know Christ as your Savior. Amen. They don't have another, there's not another plan. There are some churches that are teaching today it doesn't make any difference if you're Muslim, Hindu, or whatever. That's not true. I heard a man say that's a well-known pastor. He said, you know what? Uh, and in India, they don't worship the same way, but they worship the same God. No, they do not. They have 330 million gods in India. That is not what the Bible teaches. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth, and there's nobody comes to the Father but by me. If the Bible says it, let me go ahead and tell you this. If the Bible says it, it is true. Amen? And so now let's get to the fourth chapter. We found out that everybody, Jew, Gentile, uh, doesn't make a difference who it is, are, are sinners until they know Christ. Amen? And uh, uh, so now in the fourth chapter, we're going to go on. We're going to talk about salvation. A couple of big points that we're going to make is it's going to talk to you about somebody who was saved before the law of Moses and how he got saved. And this is going to talk to you about somebody who got saved uh, during the law of Moses. And there's uh, some people look at the Old Testament and they'll say, well, nobody got saved in the Old Testament. Yes, they did. Uh, they were made righteous in the Old Testament by faith in the same way that we do now. Amen? As a work of grace. So Romans 4, starting in verse 1, says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as per pertaining to the flesh, hath found? In the New Living Translation, by the way, I'm, I'm falling more and more in love with it. It says, Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? Second verse, for if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Uh, in the New Living Translation, it says, in his good deeds, if his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. But, but 
But that was not God's way. In other words, God, God doesn't, if, if, if following the law was the only way that you could get saved, then the Gentile would be lost. And so the law, following the law, was never the way, uh, the way of salvation. What the law did, as we saw in the third chapter, is all the law did was pronounce you guilty. It came, uh, it came, the law was given to those that are under the law, in I think 319 it said, uh, given to those under the law that every mouth might be stopped and the whole world might become guilty before God. That's the purpose of the law, to point out that you're sinners. That's, that's the purpose of it. Amen? But guess what? If you're saved and you, you're here today and you said yes to Christ, quit talking about how you're a sinner. The truth about it is when you accepted Christ, you went from being a sinner to a saint. Say, I'm a saint. And I, see, you're a saint. You don't have to have some pope appoint you as a saint because Jesus appointed you as a saint. Amen? And I'll walk out of here and say, Bob Caps is against popes. I don't care about that one way or another. Amen? If Abraham were justified, if he'd been declared righteous by works, then maybe he could boast about that. But he couldn't boast it before God. He could glory in himself and say, I've accomplished this and I've accomplished that. But he can't really stand before God and boast about what he has done because the, the standard of perfection has already been set. The truth about it is nobody, nobody is going to make heaven without becoming absolutely righteous. Unless you are without sin, you'll never make it to heaven. And the only way you can be without sin is have the righteousness of Christ imparted to you. So here, that's what, that's what has happened. So it's talking about Abraham. It was assumed that Abraham good, had good works. Everybody assumed that. He accomplished great things. The fact is the matter, he had many of them. But the truth about it is, is that good works won't get you to heaven. Well, he was justified by what? His works? No, by his faith. James and Paul, sometimes people think they contradict each other, but James said, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Now, wait a second. He wasn't justified by works in the way that you and I think of works. He, the works that he did was the work of faith. He offered his, his son up uh, to be a sacrifice because Jesus, I mean, because God the Father told him to do that. He climbs that mountain, and before he offered his son up to be a sacrifice, at the base of the mountain, before he ever went up, what did he say? You wait around here because my son and I will return. How did he know that? He knew that either God would give him a replacement sacrifice or God uh, uh, would raise him from the dead. But he knew he was coming back down that hill with Isaac. He had faith. Abraham wasn't under the law. Was his faith built upon the law of Moses? No, it didn't even exist. He was counted righteous because of his faith. And he goes on to talk about that. But why didn't he, why, did, did he follow through with killing his son? No, why? Because there was provided a, a, another lamb. The Lord will provide, amen? The Lord God will provide. James goes to the end of Abraham's life to the time that he offered up Isaac. Abraham stood on the same ground on which the weakest sinner stands. Every sinner comes to God by faith through the magnificent grace of Christ. He didn't make another way. Why, why do some things in the Bible, are they repeated over and over and over and over again because he wants you to get it down? Why, when I witness to some people, do they tell me, listen, it's not that I'm opposed to Christ, and as soon as I can get some things straightened out in my life, I plan on coming to church and getting my life. But I'm going to say, you can't do that. You stink. Amen? Remember that principle, God is good, people stinketh. And so we need this good God and what he can do inside of our lives. In the third verse, for what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God and it was counted for him for righteousness. In the New Living Translation, for the scripture tells us Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Because of your faith in God, God puts you in right standing with him. Not because of something that you've done or something that you failed to do. The scripture is the final authority. Remember this right here, that the Bible is the word of God in such a way that whatever the Bible says, God says. 
Whatever the Bible says, you want to know what God's will is? Look inside the Word. It hasn't changed. Amen. Did anybody ever hear, you ever hear anybody say this, or did you ever think this thought? Why was God so mean and spiteful in the Old Testament and so nice in the New Testament? I've had people say that. Why did he change the way he operated? He never changed the way he operated. He's always hated sin. Always has. The difference is in the New Testament, he punished his own son for that sin. His own son stood in our place and took the punishment that God had to offer. Does this make sense to anybody? His own son took it. Propitiation. The mercy seat. We bring that up periodically because it's a good thing to look at inside of that Ark of the Covenant even before the high priest went in. Inside of that Ark of the Covenant was the, the broken tablets of commandment. The tablets of commandment were in there. Aaron's rod that budded was in there. A pot of manna was in there. The pot of manna represented man's rejection of God's provision. Aaron's rod that budded represented man's rejection of God's appointed authority. The commandments represented man's rejection of God's law. And so once a year when the high priest went in there would, would put the blood on the mercy seat, there were two cherubim of figurines that were on it that constantly symbolically looked down at the elements of man's rejection of God until the, the high priest would put the blood on the mercy seat and then all the, the, the symbolic uh, seraphim could see was what? The blood. All they could see was blood. And so the same thing happened. The Bible tells us in Hebrews that Jesus went in to the tabernacle in heaven that the one on earth was just a copy of. And he went in there and he took his own blood and he placed it upon that mercy seat forever sanctifying us who brought us into a place of perfection. And all of our sins and everything represented as sin uh, were inside of that. Now, all of a sudden, God sees the blood rather than us, rejection, uh, our rejection of, God, of God's law. He sees the blood of Christ. Anybody glad of that? Every time we reject God, it was already symbolic inside us. When Jesus put his blood on that mercy seat, it forever perfected his saints. You can turn to your neighbor and say, I'm perfect because you are in the sight of God. We're body, soul, and spirit, but your spirit is perfect. Can you say amen? amen. That's pretty tremendous, isn't it? I love what God has done. God didn't give a, a, a special consideration for some people. What did he say? That everybody, whom, uh, uh, whomsoever will may come. Anybody that wants to come to Christ can come to Christ. And some people would say, yeah, but this sinner is a whole lot worse than the other sinner. No, no, sinners are sinners. And they need a Savior. Amen? Abraham just believed God. Now listen to this. I want you to think about it. There was no honor, no merit in Abraham believing a faithful God. Why? God's a God that cannot lie. It wasn't like he had to muster up enough faith to believe God because he already had identified who God was. God was the one that cannot lie. And if God makes you a promise as the God that cannot lie, it's no great work on yours to believe. We're just believing a God who cannot lie. Do you guys see that? God made a statement. He made a promise. God undertook to fulfill it. And Abraham just believed in his heart that God was going to do the thing that he said he was going to do. I love it. I love it. Believe in God. Now what a promise. Through you is going to, is going to come a seed. And then he gets later on in his life, he's, he's an old man, he's married to an old woman. And they laughed at the idea that they could have a child. I'd like to have been there the day when God enabled them. I'll probably get a call about this. But literally, God made her body new again, and he made Abraham's body 
well able to do what he needed to do long before there was Viagra. No, no. I, you think I'm just joking, but I want you to see the miracle in this thing. The miracle in, in this thing, part of it is that he was always able to bring life where there is no life. He took an old man, an old woman, and said, you're going to have some fun. <laughs> I'm moving on. In the fourth verse, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. In other words, when people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they've earned. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. In other words, but people that are counted are righteous are not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. Man, I'm glad about that. I am in that group. The one who's had his sins forgiven. Are you glad about that? Man, you've had your sins forgiven. If you had never experienced anything else from God, but you had your sins forgiven. All those mistakes that you guys keep bringing up to each other are already under the blood. You ever get in a fight with your spouse and you talk about something that happened two years ago? In the heat of the battle. Those, those good conversations. Well, I want to tell you something, Bob. You have never put a toilet seat down in your life. <laughs> so, honey, baby, you're telling me that at 62, I've never put. Anybody ever have silly discussions like that? Most of them are pretty silly, aren't they? Where do we get like that? How do we get like that? I, I, I. Someday, it'll click in you that most of the things that happen to us that cause us to point our fingers at other people really come the, from the fact that we don't understand who we are. I could go around finding fault with a lot of people if I wanted to find fault, but the point is I stand in front of my Savior realizing that I am bankrupt apart from him. Realizing the Scripture has confined us all in the same place, there's none good, no, not one. Have I the right to point fingers at other people? No, I don't think so. I stand in front of my Savior and I say, Thank you, Lord. Everything that you've done is the work that you've done. It certainly has nothing to do with me. I just thank you. The life that I live, uh, uh, the, the life of holiness that's important to me is only important to me because Christ lives in and through me. I still remember when we were part of a church for a long time and uh, they realized that, that we had never joined and they, one of the elders came to me and they said, we realized that you have never become a member. You're working the altars, singing in the praise and worship team. You've never become a member. I said, no, I can't become a member here. You love this church. Yes, I do. Well, why can't you become a member? Because you want me to sign a paper that says I won't smoke or drink. They said, you don't smoke or drink. No, I do not. Then why can't you sign that paper? Because it's stupid. <laughs> why in the world did you pick those two sins? If I didn't sign the paper that said I didn't smoke and drink, but I cheat on my wife and lie and steal, will that be all right? <laughs> well, he said, we can't list every sin. Yeah, so you shouldn't list any sin. What you should, if you wanted me to sign a paper, it would have to say this right here. As much as lies within me, I will allow Christ to live through me. Now that, I'll sign that. Does that make sense? Where do we get this mentality of pointing our fingers? Because we, uh, we haven't figured out that we're not under the law. There's none righteous. No, not one. There are people that will argue, well, I know some people that are pretty good, but how good? How good? Do I believe God or is God a liar? There's none righteous, no, not one. If you could name somebody good, you'd be mistaken. Faith is the only condition. And that's what this chapter is about. There's no merit in faith, but it's the only way of receiving what God freely offers. 
It doesn't make me a wonderful person because suddenly I have faith. It means I have just believed a God who cannot lie. So it starts out talking about salvation for Abraham, who was not under the law. The law of Moses hadn't been given yet. Now he moves on to salvation for David, and, and David was saved while the law was here. Even as David, it says in 6th verse, even as David also describes the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Somebody say without works. So David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who were declared righteous without working for it. David lived under the law. Abraham did not. But it took faith for both of them to be saved. The Mosaic system, the law didn't come from 400 years after, after the life of Abraham. Seventh verse, saying, blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Psalms 32, I believe that's from. And uh, 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 the, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven. I'm one of those. Say, I'm one of those. Your lawlessness and your wicked deeds, they have been forgiven. Why? Because Jesus already paid the price for it. How many times does he have to offer his son on a cross for us to realize that he's already taken care of our sin? How many times are we going to have to have that the law preached to us, thou shalt not, again, for, before we realize that the truth about it is I'm not under the thou shalt nots anymore. I'm under the thou shalt. Is this saying anything to anybody? David deliberately broke the law. He didn't do it ignorantly. He knew what he was doing when he looked down on Bathsheba. Saw her bathing. He knew what he was doing. Called her up. Slept with her. Sent his, uh, her husband Uriah, Uriah right out in the midst of the heat of the battle. Told him the captains of that army to draw back so he'd be killed. He's a murderer. An adulterer. That's what he is. But you know what else he is? Forgiven. Somebody say Forgiven. It speaks of the very tenderness of our God and our Savior who takes the sinner into his arms of love and, and receives him without constantly slapping, upside, slapping him upside his head for his mistakes. His sins are taken care of because Christ died and shed his blood. In the eighth verse, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Right now, let's put that 2 Corinthians 5, whatever. 19, something like that. Until I'm a real scholar of the Bible. I, if it's not that, it's something else. It was God personally present in Christ, reconciling and restoring the world to favor. Now listen, I, I don't even want to move past that. What did he do? I want you to hear this. Because our, our, our idea as Christians is that he has restored to favor all those that will say yes to him. That is not true. He has restored to favor the whole world. But they can still go to hell if they don't receive Jesus as their Savior. Amen? So he's restored the whole world to favor with himself, not counting up and holding against men their trespasses, but canceling them and committing us to the message of reconciliation and restoration to favor. That's the wonderful place we have. He's already taken care of our sins. And I want to tell you, it makes pretty good offerings and pretty good altar calls if you can get somebody that will pound that pulpit about your sin, and every time they pound that pulpit about their, your sin, they're acting like the grace of Christ doesn't exist. Let me go ahead and tell you this right now. I am as sinless as Christ was because I am in Christ and he is in me. Can you shout hallelujah? hallelujah? Now I live in this world in the flesh and I make a lot of mistakes in the flesh. And I have some thoughts I shouldn't have. Anybody else like me? You old sinners? No. But our problem is, is that we need to get to the place to realize what Christ did upon that cross. He canceled out our sin. 
The problem in relationship with God isn't that, that we're covered in sin. The, the problem with our relationship with God is we haven't received him as our Lord and Savior. He's restored us to favor, but we've not received that favor, and we're not walking in it. Does that make sense? Blessed is the man to who will not impute sin. 2 Samuel 12, 13, talking about David, said the Lord... Nathan told him this. He told David this. The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Is that pretty good or what? I'm going to read those verses in the, in the New Living Translation 6 through 8. David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. Oh, what a joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. And yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. If we even understood that when we were trying to lead people to Christ, our message isn't that they're a horrible sinner. The message is to even the unbeliever, your sins have already been taken care of. Will you receive Jesus today as your Savior? He won't force you to be saved. But our message isn't to the world how horrible they are, but the fact that our message to the world really should be this right here, that God has already forgiven their sin, that they need to receive him as Lord and Savior and live for him. Ninth verse, cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. In the New Living Translation it says, now is the blessing only for the Jews, or is it also the uncircumcised Gentiles? Well, we've been saying that Abraham was counted as righteous by God because of his faith. In, in the 10th verse, now, how then was it then reckoned? Was it in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision, which, which is a really long way of saying that, that, uh, uh, that Abraham was counted uh, righteous before he was circumcised, and the circumcision was just a sign of what had happened in his heart. When we baptized whatever it was, six or eight people the other day, did you know that was just a sign of what God had already did? That, that baptism didn't save them. We discovered last, didn't we, last week when we studied the Holy Scriptures that circumcision doesn't save or make somebody a Jew. The circumcision of the heart does. When they were separated and had faith unto God, then being circumcised was a sign that that had happened. New Living Translation says, but how did this happen? Was he counted as righteous? Only after he was circumcised, or was it before he was circumcised? Clearly, God accepted Abraham before he was circumcised. Is this a lot? There'll be a test. I want to remind you guys about Minister's Training School at 4, uh, at 4.30 today. And, uh, uh, and so uh, I hope you got your outlines ready. If you don't, you're, you're not flunked out of the class. I just take a three-foot ruler and whack you in the forehead. No. Amen. Amen. 11th verse and 12th verse. And he received the sign of circumcision. And we'll say sign. Talking about Abraham received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which, had, uh, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision to those who are not of the circumcision only, but also walk in the steps of faith of our father Abraham, which he was uh, yet been circumcised. I'm going to the New Living. Circumcision was a sign that Abraham already had faith, and that God had already accepted him and declared him to be righteous even before he was circumcised. So Abraham is the spiritual father of all those, uh, of those who have faith but have not been circumcised, they are counted as righteous because of their faith. And Abraham is also the spiritual father of those who have been circumcised, but only if they have the same kind of faith Abraham had before he was circumcised. All of that to say this. What, all those exterior things that they did meant very little if you didn't have a circumcised heart, if you hadn't been separated into God if you hadn't come to God in faith. And that really is how everybody comes to God, Amen. by faith. Amen? Does that make sense? For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. 
Clearly, God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants were based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God. God made that promise to Abraham long before he was circumcised, or b before circumcision was even introduced. And Abraham believed God, and that's all there is to it. Boy, I'll tell you what, we've sure gotten religious in these latter days, haven't we? When you ask somebody, you'll say, well, what's it take to go to heaven? How do you know you're going to go to heaven? Well, it's because I accepted Christ as my Savior, and I live a holy life, and I pay my tithes. And Don't add anything after that. You will see the kingdom of God because you have accepted Jesus as your Savior, period. And what would, be that, what would be that separation point? If we knew that we were all saved, but one person lives more holy than the other, then who, 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 may, who would make that decision about who's going to go to heaven based upon holiness? But it couldn't be based on that. Why? Because he said that all of our righteousness is his filthy rags to the Lord. If you're out there today and you're struggling with a, with a, with a habit or you're struggling with something, the truth about it is... Uh, you may be condemning yourself, but God's not condemning you. He wants to strengthen you and help you out of your problem. Amen. Amen. For if they be, uh, uh, for they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, promise made of no effect, because the law worketh wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. This will be our last verse. I want you to get a hold of this. In the New Living Translation, if God's promise is only for those who obey the law, and I'm going to say this in a different way, because he talks about the law that was written in, in stones, the commandments. If God's promise is only those who obey the Ten Commandments, then faith is not necessary and the promise is pointless. For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. Why? Have you met the person that could obey it? Who is that person? The only way to avoid breaking the law is to have no law to break. Think about that for a second. The only way... For you to become what God wants you to become, the only way that you can live a life without transgression is if there is no law. That's the reason that the law was done away with, so we might live in this covenant of grace. So that I am made right with God by faith the same way that Abraham did, the same way that David did. I come to Christ with a believing heart, believing that his promises are true. That if I will believe in my heart that Jesus died for my sins, was buried and raised on the third day. If I'll confess him as my Lord, I'm saved. I'm saved. Some people that get saved that you lead to the Lord, and I've, I've done it in prisons and bike rallies and out on the streets and everything else. When they can, some of those people will struggle their whole life with sin. They're going to be in the same heaven that you are. The rewards may be different, but they're... I mean, the same heaven as you are. Other people get a hold of Christ and they start living for him. They allow Christ to live through them. And they live wonderful lives, leading others to Christ and accomplishing great things in their life. God doesn't look at that person and say, I love you more than I love the one that never was victorious. He says, he says I sent my son. So you could live in one of two categories, lost or saved. Not saved, more saved, and abundantly saved. Just lost or saved. Without Christ, you're lost. With Christ, you're saved. Is anybody glad of that today? Amen. Hallelujah. Well, last, last Sunday night we had a service in the little church. I never got to preach. The Holy Ghost just fell in that place, and I never got to preach. And there were people with... Offering the prophetic and people crying out to God. I'm all right with that. Did you know that? God wants to do a work in all of our lives. I don't have my glasses on. Is that John back there? Wave at me, John. We got Jim Easter here today with his beautiful wife and, and her sister. And uh, Jim put the electrical in this building when we built it, you know, a long time ago. That's why we have lights, camera, action. 
You are so important to God. He would love it if you'd quit condemning yourself and condemning others. He'd love that. He paid for your sins already. Will you receive him as Lord? That's the key. Let's stand to our feet for just a moment. We're going to have communion this morning. Before we do that, though, I want to give you an opportunity for some prayer. I just have it on my heart to say this this morning. If you came here today, you've been struggling with a problem. Maybe it's, maybe it's addiction. Maybe it's not addiction. Maybe it's a, some other problem, an anger. Or so, I don't know what it is. But you've really been struggling and just feel like you can't overcome and you just like some prayer for it. If that's you, I just want you to slip your hand up real quick. Slip your hand up. All right, just stay, keep it up there, man. Anybody else be honest enough to struggle? Keep your hand up. Now, those that are, other, that are around them, look around, you guys. Look around. They got their hand up. I want you other guys to get around them. Body ministry, get around. They got their hand up. The rest of you, get out of your chair. Go pray for them. If they got their hand up. Go pray for them. You see somebody with a hand up, crowd around them and pray for them. Amen? Pray for them. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, I love the Lord. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus. Well, I found in him friends so kind and true I would tell you how it changed my life completely he did something that no other friend could do But I'll never understand 
why it came to save me till at last I see his blessed face above no one ever cared for me There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else to take the sin and darkness from me. And oh, how much he communion and we're going to dedicate a baby we're going to dedicate a baby today uh remain standing for just a moment we're going to uh, come on forward guys then you can walk out get your communion elements the broken body and the blood of christ and bring it back to your chair amen come on down and can't make it up here we'll get it to you communion even if you're not a member here you can come forward partake
Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, he said because they didn't uh, rightly judge the body, uh, that many of them were sick and many of them sleep or many of them had died. He didn't say uh, that they didn't discern the blood, but they said he didn't discern the body. The broken body of Christ brought us healing. By his stripes we were healed. The blood was shed that we might have eternal life. We need to look at both of those things. It means that we're one with God. When we take communion, we recognize what happened in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We're one with God and we're one with each other when we take communion. It's a beautiful thing, but in many churches it's a very solemn thing. And God never intended it to be a solemn thing. The proof of it is that we find in the 11th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians that it turned into a party. You can't take a dismal thing and turn it into a party. And so it was always a time of rejoicing. Is anybody glad that Jesus died for us today? Amen. 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 A time of rejoicing. Father, we thank you and we praise you for these elements as we partake. We thank you, Lord God, that uh, they are the body, the broken body that brought us healing. And they are the blood that brings us eternal life. We thank you and we praise you. We ask that you bless these elements. As we partake of the body and the blood, we receive healing and we reaffirm our salvation. We thank you and we praise you for that in Jesus' name. For I received from the Lord that uh, which I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was handed over took bread. And after he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. This do in remembrance of me. Break it and eat. same way also the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me as often as you eat this bread drink the cup you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes take and drink amen 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 baby dedication this morning. Hallelujah. 